let us start with our um, second round of um, a presentation. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Efi Athanasopoulos. And uh, so Efi Athanasopoulos, um, as I learned yesterday, is from Patras originally and uh, teaches uh, at the University of Nebraska. She's a uh, historical archaeologist uh, interested in landscape studies, uh, social archaeology, medieval and post-medieval uh, material culture, and also in the role of uh, digital, uh, digital technologies in teaching and research, uh, so very uh, important uh, modern technologies, uh, not only for archaeology, but uh, uh, for uh, historical studies uh, in general. And um, so uh, she is now primarily working in the region of uh, Nemea, which you also see here on, um, on uh, the picture. Um, um, this is northeast of Peloponnese. Yeah, right. I, I actually had to ask my wife, and she was angry with me because I didn't know. But <laughs> <laughs> now it's, uh, it's clear. And, um, so, uh, um, and also a project landscape archaeology and uh, the medieval countryside results of the Nemea uh, uh, Valley Archaeological uh, Project. So this uh, came out uh, in 2016. And today um, she is now talking about uh, medieval landscape and settlement in southern Greece. And I just changed the title. <laughs> I mean, it's different, yeah, okay, yeah, oh, so, okay. listen to village, but yeah. <laughs> it was, okay. I mean, I selected that title as a generic title when we had to submit the speaker's of course. course, and as I was reading Mark's work, mm -hmm. I decided to change it to this. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for this wonderful workshop. It is already really rewarding, and it is wonderful hospitality and uh, it is a real you know treat to be able to read Mark's work and to offer ideas on these very dear topic to me. So I'm not going to start with a PowerPoint yet I just will have it there. Um, it's more for the case study that I will present as the Byzantine village that I'm familiar with. So for the first part primarily I'm going to talk about um, the work of Ageli Kilaim, and I found myself in a dialogue with her as I was reading Mark's work. So I'm joining this discussion from the perspective of a landscape archaeologist. And one of the fundamental issues in this discussion is what constitutes a village and what is a common definition for this type of settlement things that already Mark referred to in his talk. So there is a general agreement that village or choreon as a term, refers to a permanent nucleated settlement. Its size is rather ambiguous. It can vary from clusters or farmhouses to hamlets or even small towns. It signifies an organized settlement where rural households engage with agricultural production. It also denotes a group of families, a community, which interacts with larger economic and political structures. Another important aspect is the fiscal and economic character of the village. The 12th century fiscal treaties re refers to the Byzantine Chorion as a nucleated community of tax-paying free peasants and distinguishes it from other types of rural settlements such as ktisis or dispersed farms. So Geliki Laiu, in her seminal study on the Byzantine village, that was in 202, has noted that the village has a somewhat elusive definition. So in her paper, she provides a good overview of overall research on the topic. And overall, as we know, she is one of the scholars that has contributed the most to the study of Byzantine peasant society. So she examines the relations between the state, the rural population, and the landowning aristocracy, the organization of the Byzantine rural economy, and overall agrarian relations and production based on documentary and legal sources. But also she has a segment in her paper where she talks about new evidence based on archaeological studies. And I will comment quite a bit on that. <coughs> and here I use quite a few quotes from her work. She says, we have the progress of archaeology and the broadening of questions posed by archaeology 
whether excavations or survey archaeology, the kind of work that I do. It must be said at the outset that the archaeological evidence is not anywhere as extensive as we would wish it to be. It is not available to the same degree for all of the territories of the Byzantine Empire. And certainly it is, not distributed, it, it is distributed differently in terms of chronology as well. Then she discusses work that is kind of new for 202 in northern Syria, especially in late antiquity, Lycia, service in central Anatolia and Cyprus. And then for the Middle Byzantine period, she says, the pickings become much slimmer and mentions Panacton in Boeotia, surveys in southwestern Boeotia, work in Messenia in the Pilos region and excavations at Nicoria and also southern Argoli. But there are many more regions where we have no archaeological evidence and especially she mentions eastern Macedonia where written documentation is really rich but archaeological data is lacking. And to summarize this, as things stand now, the great wealth of archaeological information and the most sophisticated interpretations bear on the <coughs> early period, down to the late 6th or early 7th century. After that, the archaeological data become more sparse. There is little synthesis, and the interpretations are not always as convincing. It is fair to say that Byzantine sites also frequently suffer from the classical archaeologist concept of the Byzantine, or sometimes the late antique and Byzantine periods as one vast undifferentiated whole. This has unfortunate results in projects where the Byzantine remains are studied as a coda, tail, to the main object, whether classical or pre-classical. She also has comments on survey archaeology specifically, and she says, there is a debate with which archaeologists are more familiar than most historians as to the respective merits flaws and limitations of survey archaeology and excavation. The arguments are interesting and instructive, and the warnings as to the pitfalls of survey archaeology in particular, such as the difficulty of dating medieval surface finds and the question of how representative the finds are, but also of the limitations of the more profound but necessarily geographically more limited data provided by traditional excavations. All of this should be kept very much in mind. And she agrees with Jacques Lefort that survey archaeology has specific uses in the study of the territory of a village, since it allows for the examination of an area larger than that of an excavation site, and can provide valuable information <coughs> as to the area's resources and its organization. So both excavation and survey archaeology have produced a certain quantity of new data on the village as well as on the structuring of the countryside that belongs to it. But she also cautions that archaeological data alone can only give part of the answer to the questions that are connected with the rise and function of the villages. And archaeology on its own can provide erroneous interpretations or no interpretations at all of important phenomena, such as the organization of production and social relations. Certainly, all other sources, documentary, narrative, artistic, epigraphic, numismatic, and so on, have to be used to create as complete a picture as possible, to approach old questions in new ways, and to pose new problems. So I agree with most of these statements in Laiu's work. And the question is whether we have made any progress in the last 20 years. And I believe that we have. So, as Sharon Gerstel has noted in her monograph in 2015, the study of the late Byzantine agrarian village, especially in Greece, has come increasingly under the intense scrutiny of archaeologists and architectural historians. Sharon also stresses that in order to investigate the landscape of the village, one first needs to define it. The legal, the legal language of the tax treaties the archaeological language of ceramic scatters and habitation remains, and the ethnographic and archaeological language of setting all contribute to an understanding of the village's plan, its features, and its population. So she provides a working definition, which Mark discusses as well. 
villages measure roughly one to eight hectares. They can be identified through the recovery of large quantities of pottery in a range of wares, including glaze balls and plates, plain wares for table use, cooking pots, and storage vessels. And of course, architectural remains even though in most cases it is churches or chapels that are the only standing buildings and testimonies of former rural communities. So Mark has built on this framework and begins the discussion with the village as a fiscal unit and how tax burden and debt could drive members of the community away and the complexities that that creates. He also discusses examples of village forms extensively, especially settlements in the region of Mani that he's so familiar with. The settlements are small, 20 houses or less, built on terraced mountain sides, placed near the land and near the uh, uh, agricultural terraces, dressing floors, the agricultural landscape overall. But also settlement size is an important part of the discussion, which seems to differ quite a bit. Um, so if we look at the Peloponnesus, he mentions also the work of the Morea project. Settlements seem to be comparable with about 35 structures or so, but there are differences in the built environment. Most of them have the presence of a keep, which is not common in money. We also have Panaktut, which, was, which is one of the few excavated villages in central Greece. It is similar in size, it has a central fortified tower. So these are some of the examples that he discussed early on. So I find this to be a very informative discussion, but of course, I also find it somewhat limited given the wealth of settlement information that we have available for the Peloponnesus. Then other areas that he brings in is Cappadocia, the villages of Cappadocia, which are difficult to define based on size. And the main characteristic is the presence of elite architecture with ornate courtyard complexes. There is also a smaller excavated settlement which consists of simple two-room houses, so there is more variability there. He also has a discussion of Macedonia based on practica rather than physical evidence, and there again we have about 33 households per village, and um, he discusses about 32 villages based on uh, the work of Laiu, Lefort, and others. And there is variability in the built landscape. Some are fortified, others are not. So clearly there is variation, which could be attributed to different topography, as well as construction materials and methods, but also particular historical circumstances, given that the comparisons are between diverse geographical regions. There is agreement that a comparative perspective of settlements and villages in different regions is desirable. Nevertheless, I believe that the selections require some additional reasoning, which I'd like to bring that up for discussion um, when we have the chance. So Mark recognizes that the Cappadocian elite complexes are difficult to compare with the villages of the Peloponnesus. Then are the case studies meant to document the diversity of settlement across Byzantium? especially in the case of Cappadocia, the very well-preserved elite complexes. Are these case studies selected for some other reason? So again, part of that discussion that I think that we should have. I also wonder whether the inhabitants of these diverse settlements indeed shared identical life ways, economic and social concerns. Were there kind of timeless and relatively uniform patterns that these communities shared? Are we viewing rural communities as relatively simple, relatively undifferentiated, and slow changing more than they actually were? Are we emphasizing shared universal features at the expense of regional differences? So my next remark is on size variation, which also requires some additional discussion, I believe. So Mark states that whether 15 houses or 200 something bound these settlements together into a common identification. And here we can come back to Lai's comment about the lucid definition of the village and the difficulty in separating a small village from a hamlet or a large village from a town. So does size of a settlement matter? Should we lump together settlements that vary significantly in size? 
are we masking significant variation by doing that? So I would argue that size should not be the sole criteria, but it is important for understanding the hierarchical nature of settlement and the spatial characteristics of a settlement network. So clearly, besides size, the function of a settlement can be determined by other criteria. Already he mentioned presence of government officials, which indicates an administrative function, for example. So for the rest of my presentation, I'd like to discuss the original landscape approach and the progress that we have made in understanding rural settlements since Laiu's seminal paper on the Byzantine village. So excavations and archaeological surveys have made significant contributions to the study of the rural countryside and the spatial distribution of Byzantine settlements. So we have the early pioneering projects, what we consider the early surveys, extensive surveys undertaken in Greece, that started back in the 1950s. We have the Minnesota Messini expedition. We have the survey of Milos, published as an island polity. We also have a Greek countryside, which is an extensive, but more, more less extensive survey than the others in the southern Argoid. So these were the projects that we consider the pioneering projects in Greece. And they introduced the diachronic approach, which opened new paths for the study of settlements of all periods, from prehistory to the present. So these pioneering projects produced a completely new data set of rural landscapes, including those of more recent periods, the medieval, the post-medieval, and even the early modern. So building on the successes of the early extensive surveys, large-scale intensive surveys were undertaken in several regions of Greece in the 1980s and 1990s, and they continue to the present day. Also, landscape archaeology projects have taken place in Anatolia and many other regions that belong to Byzantium. So the next one is a map where we see many of the regions where we have um, both extensive and intensive survey projects, and here we have some of the original ones like Messinia and Southern Argolid and Milos, and also some other seminal projects like Laconia, where Pam was involved. And I have worked in the region of Nemea, which is very close to Corinth. So, next, I thought that I should provide a very brief intellectual discussion about the framework of landscape archaeology. So landscape archaeology is not a Mediterranean development. It comes out of what we call new archaeology, processual studies, where you define culture as a process. So we have settlement archaeology, we have human ecology. These are the defining frameworks. And they emphasize the physical features, land use, and the ecological limitations of environments. So this framework has offered the tools to investigate the material record of all social groups, including the historically invisible, the rural population that earlier elite-centered archaeological research had neglected. It was all about Constantinople, but we knew nothing about the rural population. So in general, the processual intellectual tradition has defined the analytical framework of landscape archaeology. And this type of fieldwork originally developed in the Americas, and it was adapted to other regions, including the Mediterranean. So landscapes are approached as space, the physical setting where everything occurs. So the location of the village and its spatial relationship with smaller settlements, hamlets and farms within a region, all of that is largely determined by the availability of resources the presence of fresh water, land, natural boundaries, networks of communication. So the emphasis has been on the physical attributes of the landscape, the archaeology of place, which emphasizes the human component of space and its cultural meaning, was less well developed, at least initially. So more recently, several original projects have paid attention to sacred spaces 
and the relation between religion, identity, and memory. So this approach is examining the materialization of ideologies on land and monuments. They have effectively augmented the study of late antiquity, the Christianization of communities, and reorganization of monumental space through the establishment of churches, for example. So overall, the landscape approach pays attention to regions, large areas of land with natural boundaries and resources which sustain nucleated communities and other types of settlements in almost every period from prehistory to the present. Shifts in the location of the main settlements are documented within each region. It is around these main settlements that rural communities are organized. The main settlements are regional nodes, and through them, rural communities interact with economies of larger scales. So landscape archaeology projects build a regional hierarchy of sites, such as town markets, villages, hamlets, and farms. The settlement hierarchy is viewed within its environmental setting, water sources, arable and grazing land, natural boundaries, and increasingly as the materialization of ideologies on the landscape. So regional archaeological surveys, along with excavations, have offered a whole new approach to the study of the rural countryside and improved our understanding of the spatial distribution of settlements, including Byzantine villages. So to supplement these general remarks, I'd like to offer a case study, which is based on my long-term involvement in the region of Nemea in the northeastern Peloponnesus, which is a classical site. But nevertheless, it really has provided a lot of data for the period that we are interested in. So what are we learning about villages and rural communities in general from these data that are now available for this region? So what I have here are um, three maps. Um, this is the location of Nemea. This is the actual survey area that we, cut, uh, that, that, that we surveyed in the <coughs> 1980s. And this is the result of what we call sites, which are concentrations of material culture on the surface. They come through cultivation of the land primarily. And these are the sites that we have defined based on the material culture, primarily ceramics, and all of them pretty much date to the period between the 12th and the 13th century. The only one that goes beyond that is Polyfengi, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, when we look at these data, um, we can say that overall there is a proliferation of small sites which indicate agricultural activity that dates to the 12th up to the late 13th century. We recorded two large sites and a substantial number of small sites. They're located on the lower slopes of the hills surrounding the Nemea Valley and then in smaller valleys in the southern part of the survey. And the smaller sites vary in size. They usually cover less than a hectare. But then we have two large sites, especially this one, which I'm going to present in a bit more detail. And this is located very close to the classical site, the Sanctuary of Zeus, and it covers about 34 hectares. So what you see here is all based on survey archaeology. There are no architectural remains, but the density indicates ceramics. And this is a village that was located very close to the Sanctuary of Zeus. And basically, it is these people that are cultivating the area that was excavated. And they're leaving pretty much their trash you know, behind. And that's what we recovered in the excavations. And this is briefly what I'm going to present. So we talked about the significance of water. This is a fountain, which is in the middle of that settlement. And this is a source of water that we know back from the classical period, even before. So the presence of water, of course, is very important for continuing settlement. <coughs> so this is a comparison of the survey data, and especially the village that uh, we call Site 600. Then this is a map of the excavations. The excavations uh, have taken place um, in the 1970s and 1980s. It is the University of California, Berkeley. They're still continuing, 
but primarily we have the older data, legacy data, from Stephen Miller's excavations. So the area that was excavated was the Sanctuary of Zeus, again a classical site, and the classical stadium. And what you see here is the relation uh, in an aerial photograph. This is the Sanctuary of Zeus, here is the Temple of Zeus. The village, the Byzantine village, is right there, site 600, and the fountain is right there, and then the classical stadium is right here. So basically, the classical stadium is part of that uh, space that we understand was site 600, our Byzantine village in the area. So this is meant just to show you in larger scale the information that I already provided, and this is again the, special re the spatial relationship between these different components. So from the excavations, we have a wealth of information. This is the work that we're currently doing and we're publishing it. And here we have kind of color-coded squares that indicate different activities. Most of the activities were farming <coughs> in the form of farming trenches. They look like, you know, what you would do for a vineyard. So there wasn't any pollen analysis or that kind of thing done at the time. But there are extensive gardens, which are spread out all over the excavations. There are specific areas where we have a few structures. I'll show you just one, which is in this square, very close to the Temple of Zeus. We also have a basilica. And very close to the basilica, we have some huge pottery dumps that uh, um, are producing very interesting information. And the understanding is where all this material was coming from, it was the people who lived just, you know, in the vicinity of the site. So we don't have much of architecture, but we have a lot of what they left behind. <coughs> so this is again a larger version of what I showed you before. And here we have an early depiction of the Temple of Zeus, and right there we have a mound that was the basilica, an early Christian basilica, where there was a chapel that was built that apparently the community was using. We never got a chance to really study that. In the 1880s, the French archaeologists who initiated work, they removed that. And that was the first thing they removed. So we never got a chance to really learn much about the chapel. Uh, nevertheless, from the excavations, we have a lot of burials. And these are really indicating that the basilica and then the chapel in the Middle Byzantine period and late Byzantine period were the center for most of these funerary activities of the community. So this is the only domestic structure that we have from the excavations. And it fits very well with the evidence that we have for other areas, a very simple two-room structure with very well-constructed cisterns. But that's about it. And this is the only photograph that we have. And this is from the published preliminary reports by Stephen Miller, Excavations at the Man. Now, we also have the stadium. And the stadium is really the spot that I'm going to concentrate. This is while it was undertaking excavation. And this is the part that is most interesting for us, because that was part of the uh, Byzantine village, more or less, and that's where we have um, their pits and trash remains. So there are two particular areas, um, these grid squares, and this is really um, very well-preserved material. It was in these kind of trash pits. They were just 12th and 13th century material. There is no classical, there is no later. So they're what we call closed deposits, so they're very interesting. So I'm going to show you briefly material that came out of that and what we have learned about the daily life of the community based on what they left behind. So we have a lot of glazed wares. These would be the fancier wares that would be for serving food. And this is what we have used primarily for chronology, uh, trying to refine uh, our understanding of, of how these communities develop. So um, Pam is you know, one of the authorities on, on Byzantine pottery, and uh, she can 
help me out, you know, sort things out, especially when it comes to course wares. But we have all major styles of the 12th and 13th century, what is known as in green and brown. These are kind of descriptive terms. Primarily, we have them from the work of Morgan, who worked in Corinth, and he created a classification that is very descriptive. So green and brown, this is a polychrome wear cup. This is painted straffito. This is known as missiles wear, just you know, from the red dots. This is also scraffito, different styles. Uh, kind of incised champlevé wear, other forms of incised scraffito. So again, all of that is widely distributed in every part of the Byzantine world. But we know them best from Corinth because we are located much closer to that excavation than to any others. And you see we have excellent preservation from these closed deposits. This is again scraffito. This is another type of scraffito. This is a later form that we also call the Gian wear, and some fancier wares such as this one. So these are the ones that are producing more refined chronology. And then we have a lot of the things that they were using in their daily lives. So we have transport kind of vessels, such as the Greek term magarika, which you know, we would call it an amphora. So pretty much these came from these closed deposits. We have other kinds of lajinia, again amphoras, jugs, which would be for water, for liquid. This would be something that you would put on your shoulder. So um, again, we learn a lot about the um, daily vessel, vessels that they were used that they were using. We have a wide variety of serving vessels, um, and some are reused. You see that there is a hole after that part broke. Mm -hmm. So um, a wide variety. Now this is a very interesting one. It's a flask. It looks like this. It was kind of difficult to identify initially, but by now we have many of them. So this is a flat base, and it is painted underneath, so you wonder why. But then we have pretty good examples. This one is from the Museum of Thebes. You see how these vessels, um, they would stand. We have a very good example from the Byzantine Museum in Athens, and that comes from Argos. So this would be very good for putting on a mule, on a donkey, and taking it with you on the field. So the flat side would be on the animal. And um, uh, we have a lot of them that show something about the work of that community, the agricultural community. So that's a very common vessel that they were using to bring water to the fields. We also have another very interesting item. This is a siphon. And this is what comes from Nemea. This is an example of that from Monemvasia. They have a little museum in Monemvasia. And this is how it would fit. And then when I was in the uh, conference in Athens on medieval ceramics, that was in 2018. Pam, you were there too. Um, I found this fascinating poster that has an identical item, which is from northern Russia. So, I thought that it's worth sharing. And this is a reconstruction of how this material would be used. So this is a siphoni, and with a reed, you reach, and you take as much wine as you want for serving on the table. And um, we even have um, the covering of the pithos. So if I go back, you see that the covering of the pithos has an opening. and we even have that. So this is a 3D model of that item. This is his actual, actual photograph. So these comes from the excavations, and actually this has come from the survey itself. Mm -hmm. So we learned a lot about their daily lives. We also have chafing dishes, saltaria. So these would be heated to keep sauces or other food warm. They are understood as kind of communal vessels, not individual kind of, uh, of, 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 of place of, 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 of serving. Um, so we have all of that from, again, what they have left behind. We have a lot of their cooking pots, a variety of cooking pots, but these are you know, the very common cooking pots that we have. And we have 
storage vessels. So we have pithos, we have other large containers for food storage. We even have tubs and basins that are you know, very well preserved. And these, again, come from the excavations. And this is from Corinth, which is pretty much an intact example of that. And we also have learned that there was craft production in the region. So in the south part, sites 510 and 509, they're a very interesting site because they have agricultural installations. They have an olive crushing basin. We have some coins that dated to the 11th century. There is an Agia Kiriaki chapel, and that's an old photo from the 90s. Now it's completely remodeled, but we had an opus, an opus ectilla floor. Wow. Um, and this is, again, where this material is coming from. And I'll show you the next slide. So these are very interesting objects. We <coughs> had no clue what they were initially when we collected them in the survey. But then Papa Nicola Bakirdis uh, published a very interesting study. We also have them from Corinth. And these were used as shelving in kilns to bake pottery. And many of them have glaze on them, so they were probably producing glazed pottery. And again, all of that came from the survey area. So if I go back to this slide, these two sites, 510 is where you know this material came from. 509 is where the chapel of Ayia Kiriaki is. This looks like a little monastic estate. And uh, we know from the work of other colleagues, especially Nayon Oros and Halkiriki, that very often these kind of pottery workshops went together with monastic facilities. So this is just to show the wealth of information we're getting out of survey archaeology about the organization of the agricultural landscape and even in, in craft production. So the next thing is to talk about the shift in settlement, which really happens in the 13th century. So most of the, yeah. Oh, we're out. OK. So basically, I'm going to show you that this is the main site, the main habitation site, which is Polyfengi. It is very close to Nea Nemea today. It's a whole complex of sites. And here we have a settlement at the very top, which is uh, fortified. We have a chapel, which is also very interesting which is very close to the top, that's where the 40s, that's where the rock shelter chapel is and has preserved um, information. And here is the monastery, which is on this, uh, let's say, mountain, and it's called Panagia Dubrahu. And um, more recent work by Athanasulis, actually, the effort in Corinthia, led to excavations that uh, pretty much revealed that this goes back to the 5th and 6th centuries. Oh, cool. And, you know, that was the core, and originally it was considered to be a post-Byzantine monastic establishment. So I'm just, I just wanted to use this case study to show you how much we can get um, about the way the countryside was organized and how much we can learn about settlement, both from a combination of survey and excavation projects. So sorry that it was too long, and I'm more than happy to answer questions. <laughs>